Hello everybody and welcome to your folk tales and fables. Now in today's video I've managed to, um, well actually it was a suggestion by our Naressa Partab. Hello Naressa love. Well today's video was all thanks to her because she asked for some gypsy folk tales. So I found one called um, The Tale of the um, the Jewish boy and a golden hen. Um, I do ask you to forgive my face and hair and what have you, but I'm afraid I haven't been feeling very well in between uh, Monday night and today. And I'm sorry that your uh, video is so late, but um, I just wanted you to see the rest of Elle's work that I promised you. And I, I just wanted to go ahead and read the story out to you. So today it's based on gypsy folk tales and this one's called the tale of the jewish boy and the golden hen and i really do hope that you enjoy it so please sit back and relax because the story's new to me so it'll be new to you too and thank you again larissa for suggesting that we read something from the gypsies There was once a rich nobleman who had lived with his wife for ten years without having any children. One time he dreamt that he would have a very warlike son, and another time he dreamt that a Jewish lady was going to be confined as the same day as his lady, and this was true. Next morning, this lord arose and said to his wife, Wife, I dreamt that we are going to have a child. That may really come to pass, she answered. He further told her of the Jewish lady. He said that she would be brought to bed at the very same hour as her ladyship. The good God ordained that she should be delivered of a child. The good God gave them a son. The boy's father was very joyful, as were the mother and that of the Jewish lady, who was brought to bed at the very same hour as this lady. The nobleman said to his wife, My lady, we must go to this Jewish lady in order that our child may be brought up with hers. Very well, husband, she agreed. They brought thither the Jewish lady, and she made her home there near this nobleman's dwelling. He begins to grow up, this son of the nobleman. He is very wise, yet the son of the Jewish lady is still wiser. He is now 10 years old and is eager to go to school. He learns there to perfection. His father and mother are filled with delight. Once the Jewish boy said to the Lord's son, Look here now, why not request your father to have some beautiful baths made for you in the fields? The nobleman's son approached his father, kissed his hand and also his mother's hand. Father, said he, I beg that you will build me some fine baths in the fields. Well, who should it happen to be that set themselves to this work? Two old retainers. They had seen in a town some time before a very beautiful princess. Well, what they have gone and done, these two servitors, they have caused the portrait of this princess to be painted on the walls of the baths. These two servants came back and announced to their lord, we have done everything we were ordered to do. Very good said the Lord. How much do you ask for it? We shall be satisfied with whatever your grace deigns to give us. The nobleman gave them 4,000 florins. They accorded to their Lord their best thanks. Then the Jewish boy called to the nobleman's son, Come, the baths are now built. Let us see what there is to be seen. Then they went, but this young Jewish boy was always wiser than the nobleman's son. They entered the first hall, where they saw painted upon the walls various kinds of birds and wolves, all which delighted the son of the Lord. Then by himself he enters another apartment, and what does he behold there? The portrait of this lovely princess, painted on one of the walls. He gazes at the likeness of the princess, and is so greatly enchanted with it that he swoons away. The young Jewish boy sees him season swoon that is 
he revives them with vinegar. And he asks the nobleman's son, <clears throat> excuse me, what is the matter with you? Oh, brother, if I do not have this princess to wife, I shall kill myself. Hush for the love of God, replied the young Jewish boy. Do not cry so loud, for you shall perhaps have her indeed, not only as so, so soon as you wish. He returned home very sick, this nobleman's son. What ails him? asks his father. But the young Jewish boy was ashamed to own what had happened. Orders were given to fetch doctors with all speed. Various remedies were administered, but he's nothing the matter with him, for he's quite well only withering away for the sake of his princess. What's to be done with him? This Lord asks himself. He sends the mother to question her son, that he may reveal to her what has happened. The mother comes to him. What is the matter, my child? Don't be ashamed to tell me everything. Ah, oh, mother, he answered. Even though I were to tell you all, you would not be able to give me any advice. On the contrary, my son, I will give you very good advice, she says. Then he said to her, Mother, I have seen the likeness of a beautiful princess in these fine baths. If I do not have her to wife, I shall kill myself. The mother hears this with delight. That is well, my son. In the meantime, where am I to find her? But the Jewish boy said to the nobleman, my lord, I will go with him to seek the princess. I must make myself answerable for his person, for if any harm befalls him, punish me. Very well then, says the lord, get ready and go out and seek help with the help of God. They set out and on the further side of a large town, the young Jewish man saw a beautiful wand on the road and a little key beside it. I shall dismount and pick up that wand, he said. But the nobleman's son said to him, What good will that wand do you? You can buy yourself a fine sword in any town. But the young Jew replied, I don't want a sword. I wish to take that wand. Well, he got down from his horse. He picked up this wand and the little key. He got into the saddle again, and they went on their way with the help of God. They came to a great forest, where night surprised them, they saw a light shining in this forest. See, said the Lord's son, there's a light shining over yonder. They came upon this light. They went up into the room, but there was no one there. They see a beautiful bed, but it's unoccupied. They then see there is food for them. There is a golden goblet on either side next to the nobleman's son. And beside the young Jew, there is a goblet of silver. The nobleman's son would have seated himself beside the silver goblet. But the young Jew said to him, Listen to me, brother. You are the son of a wealthy sire, and I am a poor man's son. Your place, therefore, is beside the goblet of gold, and I will seat myself beside the goblet of silver. Thereafter he disrobed him deftly and made him lie down on the bed. Come you to bed, brother, said the nobleman's son. I don't feel sleepy. Well, I don't feel sleepy either, replied the young Jew. Well, I'll try and go to sleep at any rate, he said. The young Jewish boy placed himself beside the table and pretended to fall asleep. Two ladies approached him, but they weren't really ladies. They were fairies. These ladies spoke thus to one another. Oh, this young Jew and this nobleman's son are going to a capital where they wish to carry away the king's daughter. But, said they, the young Jew did well to pick up that wand and the little key, for there will be an iron door, which with that key he will be able to open. These ladies went away with the help of God. The young Jew undressed himself and went to bed. They arose next morning. They came to that iron door. The young Jew dismounted and opened it. They see that this is the capital wherein dwells the princess. They went into this town. They see a gentleman passing. 
the young Jew says to him. Where is the first rate inn in this place? The gentleman indicated such a one to them and guided them to it. He paid them for his trouble. They ate until they were satisfied and then the nobleman's son remained in the inn and the young Jew sallied out into the town. He saw another gentleman passing. Stay, sir, I have something to ask of you. The gentleman stopped and the young Jew asked him, Where is the principal goldsmiths in this town? He directed him there and the young Jew went to this goldsmith. Will you make me an old hen and her chickens of gold? The old hen must have eyes of diamonds and the young chickens also. Very well. But I stipulate further that she be alive. The goldsmith, who was a great wizard, replied, Very good, sir. I will do so if you will pay me. Well, I will pay you as much as ten thousand. Well, three days later, he returned to get what he had ordered. He chose a Sunday, at the time when the princess was going to be going to church. It was then that he proposed to exhibit this golden hen and her chickens in such a way that the princess should see them. Well, he went to the goldsmiths. He got the golden hen with our young chickens. And on the following Sunday, he went near the church, this young Jewish man. He placed a table there and on it he exposed his golden hen with the young chicks. Nobody who passed that way thought any more about going to church but all stopped to gaze with wonder at this golden hen with her young chickens. A throng of people gathered from all parts of the town to see this hen and her chickens. The priest himself does not go into the church, but stops before the hen and her chickens. He looks at them so greedily that his eyes are almost staring out of his head. Now at last, the king's daughter comes to church. She looks to see what is going on there. A crowd of people, gentle and simple, gathered there. She had four lackeys with her. Go, she said to one of them. See what is going on there. He went and did not return. She sent a second one. No more did he come back. And then so much, he was just so enchanted by the golden chicken and the, the and golden and the little chickens. She dispatched a third. And he didn't return either. He was charmed. So she sent a fourth, and he didn't return either, being enchanted like the others. What can have happened there? she asked herself. Has somebody been killed? She sent her maid, who forced her way through with some difficulty through the people. But she didn't come back either. So much did this golden hen delight her. Another was sent, who with great difficulty forced her way through the crowd. But she didn't return, so charmed was she. Well, the princess dispatched our third maid servant, who also penetrated the throng, but being charmed didn't return. But we're seeing a pattern here. Finally, she said the fourth one, I'm sending you to see what is happening there, but if you do not come back and tell me, I will have you put to death. Oops, that's a bit harsh. This too went. went. She forced her way, after much difficulty through the crowd, but she didn't come back either, so greatly had that golden hen charmed her. The princess then said to herself, what can be going on there? Here I've sent eight people and not one of them's come back to tell me what's the matter. Then she went herself to see what had happened. Peasants and gentlemen gave way before her. She draws near and sees a golden hen with her young chickens. The Jewish boy, perceives her and asks her, Does this give pleasure to your Royal Highness? Greatly though it pleases me, sir, she answered. You will not give it to me. He took this hen and presented it to the princess. Then, with the help of the good God, he went away. But the princess called after him and invited him to dine at her father's house. The young Jewish boy returned to the inn, where the nobleman's son was asleep. Of course, he knew nothing of what the young Jewish boy had done. The king sent a very fine carriage to fetch the young Jew. He got into it and drove off. 
The princess was amusing herself with the hen and its young golden chickens. The king proposed to him that he should live with his daughter. Very well, said the young Jewish boy, I'll live with her. Well, they eat and they drink, and at length towards the night the young Jewish boy sent one, someone to fetch the nobleman's son. When he arrived, all three went out to walk in the garden. Then the young Jewish boy said to the princess, Will you go away from here with us? Yes, she said, I will go away. Well, they set out with her and hurried away with the help of the good God. The father of the princess knew not where she had gone to. Neither did he know whence the young Jew and the nobleman's son had come from. The nobleman's son arrived at his father's house. The father and the mother are well satisfied that he has been so successful in bringing home the princess. And now, my son, said his father to him, you must marry her. So he married her, and they lived together with the help of God. And the young Jewish boy was also married a wife, and they lived together with the help of God. So, and that was the end of that story. My friend, I don't know. Never seemed to use that one, did he? But at least everybody seemed to get what they wanted in the end. The young man got his, um, the princess that he said he would die over if he didn't get it. And um, the young Jewish boy who grew up as his a brother of sorts, he managed to have an adventure because he was really clever and um, he managed to be happy at the end because he found a wife of his own and he was happy so everybody's happy and who could ask for more so let's have a look at the time here oh we're quite okay then for time um, I also wondered if you fancied a quick fable and I was going to see what um, I could find for you with regard to Esau and um, I'm going to have a look down and see what I can find to read for you today. I don't know what it's going to be about um, you know, it could be, I'm just, because it's all in alphabetical order, you see, all this stuff from Aesop. And um, I'm just going to stop at one called The Monkey and the Dolphin. Right, so here's a tale from Aesop for you. And this is called The Monkey and the Dolphin. It happened once upon a time that a certain Greek ship was bound for Athens, wreck was wrecked off the coast near to Piraeus, the port of Athens. Had it not been for the dolphins, who at that time were very friendly toward mankind, and especially towards Athenians, all would have perished. But the dolphins took the shipwrecked people on their backs and swam with them to shore. Now it was the custom among the Greeks to take their pet monkeys and dogs with them whenever they went on voyage. So when one of the dolphins saw a monkey struggling in the water, he thought it was a man, and he made the monkey climb on his back. Then he swam off with him toward the shore. The monkey sat up, grave and dignified, on the dolphin's back. You are a citizen of illustrious Athens, are you not? asked the dolphin politely. Yes, answered the monkey proudly. My family is one of the noblest in the city. Indeed, said the dolphin. Then, of course, you often visit Piraeus. Yes, yes, replied the monkey. Indeed, I do. I am with him constantly. Piraeus is my very best friend. The an this answer took the dolphin by surprise, and turning his head, he now saw what he was carrying. Without much ado, he dived and let the foolish monkey take care of himself, while he swam off 
in search of some human being to save. And the moral of that story is one lie leads to another. So uh, you had the, the monkey saying, yes, he was from a noble house and that Piraeus was his best friend when it's actually a port. So it just goes to show if you're going to tell one lie, then you follow up with another lie. Before you know it, you're, um, you're just going to be head over heels in lies, aren't you? So I suppose at the end of the day, truth will out. It's always best to tell the truth. Because if you're caught out telling a lie, all the trust goes. Because when you think about it, there's nothing worse than finding out that someone's lied to you. And you find out that they're a liar. And you've trusted them probably with some confidences. And now you don't know, have they told other people what you've told them? The trust is gone. And if you give them a second chance, you just have to pray that they don't tell you another lie. It's always best to tell the truth and risk having an argument. At least the other person can say, well, at least you told me the truth eventually. So it must count for something. Anyway, my friends, I hope you don't mind me cutting this short today. But I'm still feeling a bit tired. But I just wanted to bring you another of Elle's wonderful creations. And all being well, I will be a lot more alert on Friday for our spooky sessions. So, on that happy note, I really do hope you enjoyed today's stories. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for watching. And I do love you all. I do appreciate everything you, you say and do for me. I've still got comments from Monday to Wednesday yet, so I'm going to try and get round to sorting that out so that you don't feel, you know, abandoned in any way. Because um, I don't like to leave. If you take the time to talk to me, the least I can do is talk to you. You know, at least that's how I look at it. Anyway, please take care of yourselves and stay safe during this coronavirus. It's really serious. They're closing the schools where I am. Um, all the schools in the country are going to be closed on Friday. We don't know how long for. Looks like my hubby will be working from home. But I don't know when. And um, they're rationing food. So, anyway. Take care, look after yourselves, and I'll see you again very, very soon.